עומד התפילה, אין ספר בר שם טוב, ויש קוף מ"ו. אין כלהנו ובוא אל המעשייה. שוק מספר שיאף של איטס. ושי, four different expressions. towards the end of the evening in the morning, so four different expressions to our relationship with the divine that resides in all worlds, that gives life to everything that lives. We say, en kaleni, there's no one like him. Then we say, mi kaleni, who is like him? Then we say, noi de lelehenu, let's thank, submit, praise the force. And then we turn towards it, we say, atuhu elehenu, you are the force. You are it. It means that there's a part of our experience that represents the divine. We need to learn how to turn towards that. When we say a blessing, we say, Baruch Atta, Hashem. When we say Atta, we're indicating that we have a conception in our mind of what we're referring to, what we're pointing at when we're saying Atta. If not, then we're making a mockery of the blessing. It's very important. What, who is Atta? Baruch Atta, Hashem. So where is the conception? If we say, Atahu Hashem, then we say, oh, he's beyond conception. I don't know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about him. He. Who's he? I don't necessarily know. But when I say Ato, I can't say Ato unless I'm directing myself towards an entity. We say, you are blessed. Who are you? Atta who eleni, you are the divine. Who are you? And so there's these four levels of, of realization. The first one is towards the first world, the lowest, the most revealed world. We say, and Kaleni, there's no one like the divine. Why? Because look around and see. Look within and see. Look at the form. Look how it's expressing itself. Regardless of whether you agree with it or you like it or you would do it differently, put that aside. Just look at what he made. And so in Asiya, where the angels are actually manifesting the reality, it's easy to see. that there's no one like him. There's no way. It's pointless to even try to find an entity. And so that's an Asiya. That's like a book. It's like clearly write, spelling it out for you. It's spelling out for you his power. The human mind is tricky because it includes the emotions while it's thinking. And so if it doesn't like it, it won't admit to, what, to how wonderful it is. And so who realizes the greatness and the wonder? Who can enjoy it? Who can have access to it? Only one who loves it. If you love existence, you will see the beauty in life. If you don't love existence, your heart will not let you see it. But put aside your judgments. Just look at what he did. Just look. Who we are talking about. Understand when we are going to say Ato, in which direction we're trying to point. Who are we pointing at? See. Just look at what he did. Without judgment. And you will see wonders. You will see Niflois. Wonders upon wonders. Things interact. at great distances to create perfection. Do you think it's perfect? Maybe not. But there is some form of perfection that comes out. What is that perfection? It works. The human can think and speak. It takes trillions upon trillions 
of not just cells within your one body, that, that too, but stars, powerhouses that together are going to vibrate in order to make a man that can think and speak. It works. He demonstrated. He won. And so the world of Asiya is very, very clear that there's no one. Mikaleheinu will be Yitzira. Now we're going up to one level higher. We're going from the most revealed to the level of emotion and speech. In the level of emotion and speech, it's not so clear that there's only one and he's fully in charge. Why? Because we can lie. Because we can hurt each other. And so in the world of Asiya, it's very clear. Look what he did. But in the world of Yetzirah, Mikel Heinu, who is like him? We're looking. Is there a spirit that is the same as the Holy Spirit that created it all? Is there one of these lying spirits that can give us power? Maybe there were some people who went pretty far with these lying spirits. So there's a, some type of a doubt over here in the world of Yetzir. Me, Kelehaini, who is like the divine? Will I find a spirit that is as powerful as the original spirit? Can anyone, through lying, obtain more than he would obtain by being authentic? The world right now seems to be saying yes. If we just look at the world, it seems to be saying, if you will go by force, if you will somehow outsmart the others, if you'll take your branch and just break it off completely and go against the tree, you might win. You might end up better off than those who remain attached to the tree, who remain authentic and real to the way that they were designed. This began from Nimrod. Nimrod was the one who found a way to use the power of the tree against the tree. How do you do it? You convince the branches. If you convince enough branches, you can use the power of the tree against the tree. You can use the power of the collective against the collective. And since Nimrod, we've had a lot of copycats. Some branches found this arrangement very attractive. Until today, these copycats are everywhere. They're in the economy, they're in politics, they're in their own homes, doing whatever it is that they're doing. They're everywhere. Nimrod, copied himself into billions upon billions of people. And so in the world of Yetzirah, there is a question, me, Kelahani, is there a spirit? When Mashiach comes, we will know that there is no spirit. The Ruach Elohim Rachefes Alpnei Amayim, in the time of creation, is going to reappear as clean and as beautiful as it ever was. And then we're going to know for sure, also in the world of Yetzira and Kalehenu, there is no spirit like the authentic spirit. So, Mikalehenu is Beitzira, Shef Shechalil Elita Sham, Kemoshito Acher, Nefishiro Metatren. So, Acher who was the teacher of Rabbi Meir, Alicia ben Aviu, who at the end of his life did not remain attached to the tree. Why did he break off the tree? Because he saw the spirit of Metatra and the spirit of Hanoich from the ancient world. He saw the impact he had on humanity. He saw the power that he has. And he said, humanity is a separate power. 
It's not attached to the tree. And so that's why it's called Acher, because he's someone else. There's the tree, there's the unity, and there's him. He doesn't agree that he is the tree. And so we see that in that world, we can make a mistake. I don't make that mistake. Because I know who could possibly be like the divine, who can possibly be like the Holy Spirit. That is the original spirit, the authentic spirit that was designed to dwell within the human organism. <coughs> the next one is we're going to be grateful. And this is Bibriya. This is in the world of creation. So when we get to the world of thought, there we are already getting so close to the life force that we won't make a mistake like in the world of speech and emotion. In the world of thought, if we just try to observe how thought formulates, immediately we'll surrender and praise the source that gives life. So it's coming close to the Atsilis. Atsilis is the highest level. Atsilis is not creation. Atsilis is preparation for creation. And so he's formulating some type of a formula in order to create, and yet it's just him. Everything is still very clear about who it is. And so there, there's no mistakes. And so, you, you are the one that is giving power to the entire tree, to everything that lives. And so you, when he says you in Atsilis, in Atsilis it says, you, v'chayou chad, you v'garmou chad. He and his self is one. He and his life is one. Like a turtle, that the dress is part of the body. And so Natsilis, he is preparing to create, and yet it's him. And so when we, if we're coming to say, you are, what are we saying, you are? It means that we are trying to imagine what it would feel like in the world of Atsilis. How would we imagine the world of Atsilis? We would cease to imagine. That's the world of Atsilis. Meaning, whenever we're imagining whatever we're, we're imagining, we're creating a dress for the thing that is, that cannot be known by any dress. And so if I'm saying you are, I'm saying I'm not. If I'm saying Atahu Eleheinu, you are, where am I pointing when I'm saying you? When I'm saying you, I'm pointing to a place where I'm not. What is, is him. My idea of self doesn't really exist. That's something I'm imagining. I'm drawing it. As soon as I stop drawing it, it has no existence. It's not an independent entity. It's something that I've learned to draw. But you are. You are not an idea. You are everything that is. I've covered you and dressed you with so many ideas. But you are the divine, not my ideas. My ideas might be very distant from the divine. But you, the force that lives, you are the divine. That's on the Kesa Shem Tov. Peskuf Mem Zayin, Shemati B'Shem Oyer Peresh Atu Eleheinu, Lemitchil Omer Anoichar, Chak Echom Ech Minister, Shem Soif Rodem Shir Dovuk, Bo Yizborach, Bo Noichach Panav Yizborach, Shmoy Azu Rochek Meni. Shem Soif Shir Rochek Azu Kare. Im Ken Zayr Shoma, Mishe Soif Atu, Ena Lehu, Mishe Soif Rhu, 
So he says, this is from the Tolis Yaakov Yasi. He says, Atu, Hu, Eleheinu. We're using two words to say you. So we can say you are, but who also means him. You, him, are divine. And so it says, why are we saying you, him? Why don't we say Atu Eleheinu, you? Atu Eleheinu would mean you are divine. What's the additional word? word? So it says, there's two ways of seeing. And we've touched on this before. Atto means, I believe I have a conception and I'm pointing at it. Who means, I don't know who I'm talking about. He just exists. He is everything and I don't know how to conceive it. I don't know how to draw in my mind what that means or where that is. And so then I say, who? He. Which means an entity that is not in front of me, an entity that I don't know how to address myself towards. And so he says, Ato, if someone believes that he knows who he is talking about, and so he's addressing himself towards someone, that one is distant from the divine. Because if he thinks he's addressing himself towards, if he, dream, if he thinks he has already the right conception, then he's for sure distant. He doesn't understand who you are referring to. If he thinks he already learned how to direct himself towards that entity. Had he known who you are talking about, he would know that it takes many years to try to learn how to direct ourselves towards that entity. That entity is so subtle and so emanating in all places that we can't contain him or confine him. The mind has a very difficult time trying to direct itself towards him. So one who thinks this way, he's distant. One who thinks that he's distant, one who has already understood the greatness of what he's trying to, to perceive and he understands the challenge that he's facing, he is close to understanding what he's really dealing with. So therefore, he says, Ato, if you think you are, if you think you know who to direct yourself towards, then who? Then you're distant. Then really, for you, it's him. It's someone else. It's not really what you're directing yourself at. But who? If you think that he is someone that you cannot perceive, that is beyond your grasp, then you're dealing with the real thing. That's the real way of referring to him. That's the real way of connecting to him. It's connecting to something that is so beyond you that you cannot perceive in any way. That's exactly what you're directing yourself towards. So don't think I'm directing myself towards something and then eventually I will perceive him. Because then again, you're losing the real essence. The real essence is the one that you're never going to perceive. You're going to continuously grow in getting to know him, and yet you're never going to be able to know him the way that he knows himself. If you would know him that way, then you would lose being you. And so we're going to go closer and closer to him, and yet as long as we are us, we cannot be him. And knowing is being spiritually. From the Ksoinis Passim, which is another cipher of the Tolis. Every prayer has new sparks that need to be repaired. That all week there's sparks that need to go up. 
sparks that need to go up means there is broken parts of life that are in conflict with life and they need your help in order to come out of conflict. And so these are the nitsoitsin that are going to come for repair. When we're trying to clear our mind, we're trying to direct our mind towards the nature of the truth. The parts of us that are broken, the parts of us that are against life are going to appear and need to be repaired. But all these parts are going to be processed and they're going to be stored, but they're not going to go up to the higher heavens they're not going to return to their original home until it comes Shabbos. And Shabbos by Musa, when we say Keser, that's when these sparks return. And this is because what we've been taken from, what we've lost as we came into this world and we became distant from the source, is we lost the security, the joy, the pleasure of being. We have being, we have existence, but it's painted in a broken color. It's painted in an experience that doesn't feel the way that the king feels. It's very distant from the king. It feels very wrong. It feels very broken. It's offensive. And so now I come to take this park and I want to bring him back to the king where he belongs. But if I'm not the king, then I can't take him back to the king. I have to go with him to the palace and bring him to the king. Only then have I finished my mission so that now he's home, now he's back to the king. If I take him off the street and I bring him to my home, okay, that's a nice favor, but he's not yet back by the king. And so in the weekdays, we ourselves are not by the king. So how are we going to take the spark back to the king? We can't. We can take him to our home. We can bring the spark back to where we are. But then he's with us, and he still didn't get his full redemption. But Shabbos, when the king comes to visit the queen, then when we say Keter, the crown that the king gets is when we live, exist, manifest in accordance with his will. That's his crown. The crown the king gets is not because he's a king. It's not because he has a lot of money he can buy himself a crown. The crown that the king has means that his will is what's going to be respected in the entire land. And so when does the creator have a crown? Not when he has some extra spending money so that he can buy himself a crown. He has a crown when life is being lived according to how the king wants. And so Shabbos, when we, the queen, appear in front of the king, then in the morning, when the king is in a wonderful mood, then we give him the crown. And then when we give him the crown, all the sparks that we have accumulated during the week, all the fallen pieces appear in front of the king. Now they're home. Now they've been delivered. And so it says, Shabbos is the time when the coin, who is the coin? The kindness of the creator, the, the middle, the attribute of kindness, which is the attribute that we are using in order to repair all the broken sparks, in order to reattach all the broken sparks. So, Shabbos is the a coin who ever avoid the permissive Yom Shabbos, and when he does the avoid the permissive, Bigdish has kesser oil and kolat tefilas. Can avoid the kesser. That's from the kesser's passim. The next one's from the Kutum Yekarim. Oy skuf mem tes. Meri b'sirah b'shem tov. Avu pishi mispal shachas semusa b'shabbos v'yantu b'dvaykes mispal nimchah b'loy dvaykes kol kach machem schol schol shesh nechlus gifoy moichoy. So he says they, they would daven, the morning davening is a long davening because there's a few parts to it. They would give themselves over to it so much that 
in the evening time, when it came time to have mincha, they still wouldn't have recovered. They would still they wouldn't be able to pray properly mincha because they would still be tired from the morning prayers. So they they would literally give themselves to fully experiencing the emotion in order for the impact to be real in the higher worlds. So they would completely go into, they would first prepare themselves, they would prepare their minds, they would prepare their bodies. And then when they would say the words, they would try to feel the emotion to the extent that they would tire their bodies. They would come away more tired than if they spend the same amount of time in the gym. They would come away, away more sweaty than if they spend the same amount of time in the gym. They would fully immerse into the verbal experience with all their emotion, with all their might. And this is why they were so effective. This is why, why they knew how to affect change in the higher realms. Things would actually happen after they did their service because they did their service in accordance with the design. They allowed themselves to fully experience and they kept their vessels clean so that they're ready to fully experience. This is something that's said in, in Chutzlar. It's here in Israel, you don't say it. Before, before the prayer, before the Shman Esra and, and Meir, they say, Baruch Hashem, Lord, Amen, Amen. So there, there's, there are a lot of blessings and Blessings, when we bless the force, what we're essentially doing is we're protecting ourselves from the demonic. We're just protecting ourselves from the forces that are against life because blessing the source means bringing forth more life into existence. And we are the recipients of that blessing because he, when he receives more, it means he has more desire more ability to give to the Shechina, to give to the manifested reality. Because the manifested reality has more vessel to receive. And so if we make our vessel greater so we can receive more pleasure, we're giving him a blessing because he has now where to spill forth his blessing. The more we can receive blessing, the more we are blessing him. This is why when we eat, we bless him. Because by eating, we are building more vessel, we're creating new vessels. So we're creating for him the vessel so that not that the evil spirit takes it, not that the spirit of Nimrod can have more, but that the Holy Spirit can have more. And so we say these blessings as protection in, in the night so that the evil spirits don't have power. From the Toldis. He says, when the bride gets to unite with the groom, there's a process for the unification. And every detail within the process teaches us about the nature of life and how the soul operates and how we should interact with reality in order to create the required results, in order to liberate the souls. And so he says, there are two phases when the unification happens between the bride and the groom. In the first phase, we dress her up. We dress her up from head to toe, everything, everywhere that we can add some beauty, everywhere that we can add jewelry, we try to make her as attractive as possible because we want to raise the desire within the groom so that he comes with his full desire, with his full presence. And so we try to make her as attractive as possible with all the kishutim, with all the jewelry. And then when they get to be alone, when he finally wants to consummate the relationship, then she removes everything. 
from head to toe, all the jewelry, all the clothes, everything that we placed in order to beautify her, in order to help her look beautiful in the eyes of the groom. Now, when they're actually going to unite, it all gets removed in order for the unification to happen. And so it says, so first she has all these, all the jewelry in order to beautify her. She will that she should find favor in his eyes, that he shouldn't do it out of obligation. He should do it with the full joy and vigor. And this we do all the different ways that we enhance her beauty. In the time of the unification, then you remove all the clothing in order to unite the flesh. From the nature and the way of the flesh, we will get to know the divine. So it says, prayer. Prayer, the words of prayer are the bride. The words of prayer are what need to find favor, are what need to find love in the eyes of the intelligence. And so the Shoshvinin, Shoshvinin are the bridemaids. The bridesmaid prepare the bride so she will find favor in the eyes of the groom. And so the tzaddik, the person that is trying to make this unification between the words and the intelligence, he is like a bridesmaid that's trying to make the, the bride look beautiful in the eyes of the groom. So he's the one that's uniting them through the prayer that comes from the depths of his heart. So through that, Meachet Atfila, he unites the words of the prayer, Shiakala, this is the bride, Lelaha Yisrael, to the divinity that dwells within Klal Yisrael. So he unites the speech with the soul. The soul, as these words came out of the mouth of the tzaddik, the soul, the Jewish soul, the soul of Yisrael, just marry these words. Congratulations. This is a spiritual marriage. This is a unification. This is meaningful. They're going to have children. They're going to create the world. They're going to create the future reality. So before the words be said, she needs to be beautified. The emotions need to be prepared. The mouth needs to be clean. The words need to come out in perfection so that the bride finds favor in the eyes of the groom. He is happily married to her, not by force. We have to learn the right dress for these words for these emotions so that we can say them in a way that it finds favor in the eyes of the intelligence, in the, in the eyes of the soul, in the eyes of Knesset Yisrael. And so he says, there are many different fruits that grow on the tree of life. And the fruits represent the tzaddikim. And the fruits also have peels. And the peels represent the rishoim. The fruit is sweet and it's the purpose. The peel is bitter and it's there as some form of protection. And so you won't find any fruit that doesn't have some type of appeal, some type 
of a bitter part that is holding it together or, or protecting it from the outside. They're hidden in the seed in, inside. There's somewhere you'll find something that the fruit is coming from both sides. Only in the future, once we will be redeemed from the exile, will there be fruits that have no bitter to them. People that have no bitter to them. Animals that have no bitter to them. Everything will be liberated from the bitter side. Everything is going to be complete and ready for consumption. But for now, everything comes with its opposite. And this is because so he says, why, why is there bitter in everything? Why is everything mixed good with bitter? Because the evil man overpowered the kind man. Nimrod overpowered the Ruach HaKodesh. Those who were branches that broke themselves off the tree overpowered the branches that were still representing the tree. And so, it's a time when a man is in control of another man. The Odom Abelial, the evil man, is in charge of the kind man. The evil spirit is in charge of the kind spirit. The evil beliefs are in charge of the kind beliefs. The evil emotions are in charge of the kind emotions. But this control that the evil man has, it's not good for him. Everything that he's doing while he has this control is actually poisoning him. It's going to result in him being completely removed from reality. So, So, who is it? To the evil man. So it's going to happen on its own. He sweetens the bitter with the bitter. And so by giving the bitter power over the sweet, the bitter is eliminating himself from existence. How does that happen in this case? He says, because the goal of this interaction between the bitter man and the sweet man is to save all the sparks, is to save all the parts of truth, all the parts of holiness that went into the other side, that went against reality, that went against humanity. And so according to our spirit, this is what we'll see in how life is being run on the planet. When our spirit is mixed good and evil, we will find good and evil everywhere we look, including in the fruits and in the animals and everywhere else. When we will be clean and we will only be good, we will find that good everywhere we look. That good will come at us from all sides. And so all this interaction where the evil is in charge of the good is so that the good can remove the sparks that are giving the evil life. So that the good can learn the ways of the evil and he can learn what is the evil doing right. Let's do that part right and do it for the good. And so this is why Cloud Israel went through all the exiles. They went from one nation to another nation. Every nation that came and became a superpower, it's, was, it's because they were doing something right. They were doing everything else wrong. But because of that something right, they managed to become a superpower. For, some, for a certain amount of time, they learned how to play with the settings of the stars in order to continue their existence, continue their argument with the tree allowing their broken off branches to continue the conflict with the tree. And so we go into that country 
We go into those people, we go into that culture, and we find out what is it that they're doing right. That will take. Everything else we need to do according to someone else that knows what's right. And so we're picking up. We go into Mitzrayim. They take out all the sparks from Mitzrayim. They learn everything there is to learn from their tricks until they're so used to their tricks that it, it results in the ego. They revert back to their tricks. Then we get a Torah with instructions that are related to those tricks because the original Luchos, we couldn't handle. We couldn't handle the, our real tradition. So we reverted back to some type of an Egyptian version of our tradition. And so this process is what's going to remove all the sparks from all the nations so that we can have the good from everyone without any bad. And then when we will have only the good, then we will see it in all of creation that we have liberated the good from the bad. We have liberated the sweet from the bitter. We have liberated the dark, the, the light from the dark. And this is what happens also here. So it says, based on what we said before, that the speech is the bride and we, the ones speaking, are the bridesmaid. We have to beautify the bride so that she is loved by the groom. So it says, according to this, we will now explain. Why is there an evil man that makes it difficult for the righteous? Because he is his levush. He is the dress. He is the peel that came to protect this sweetness. The sweetness of the righteous is being protected by the bitterness of the evil. How does it play out? Because he, Hiroshi, makes it a tzaddik. He, he makes life difficult for the righteous. And what happens? Kadesh Yikrami Maitza, then the tzaddik, the righteous, calls out to the source. When the righteous is comfortable, he forgives the source for his difficult life and he doesn't cry out with full emotion. And this is wrong. He shouldn't because it's not about him. This is about the Shekhinah. So what if you're comfortable? And so what are we going to do? We're going to make him uncomfortable. Why? Because we want him to call out with all of his emotion. The Shekhinah needs him to call out with complete emotion. Who is going to be in charge of making sure that he calls out with full emotion? The Rasha. And so he's the peel that protects the sweetness of the tzaddik. Why did the tzaddik come into this world? So that he can call out with full emotion, so that he can help the Shekhinah, so that he can feel her pain, so that he can wake up her husband and say, how could this even be happening? How is this possible? We need to speak with emotion. Many people ask this question intellectually. They're not helping anyone. They're just getting frustrated because they don't really believe that someone cares. They don't really believe that someone is listening. So they ask it in their mind, how could this be? But they don't let their emotions feel the question. They're afraid to feel the question. They don't think there's an answer, but no, this is the answer. Let your nature call out. This is why it was designed this way. That if the right heart sees it, he will call in. He will call in the right help that's going to result in some type of a relief. This is why Tzadikim, when they heard about a problem, that was the end of that problem. He would feel his natural response. He would feel his heart. And this would send the signal. And then the, something would change. Something would happen, sometimes even miraculously. And so the, the soul came into this mess, came into this world of conflict so that it can call out and say, hey, this is wrong. This needs to be different. And if it's going to be comfortable, say, oh, it's okay. I find a way to, to exist here. It's fine. 
It's not fine. The Shechina doesn't feel it's fine for not a single moment. It's a billion light years away from fine. And so it's going to be the peel that's going to squeeze and make sure that he re releases some of his sweetness. Your heart knows better. Why aren't you feeling it? You were designed with tremendous sensitivities. You're a treasure for the planet. Allow yourself to feel. Then he unites the bride and the groom. So these are the Kishut Elevush HaShchino, Shigoyim Mispal Mimeitzer. Who paid for this jewelry? The evil one. Not only did he pay for the jewelry, not only was he the one that squeezed the tzaddik, he's going to go through hell for what he did, all in order to have this pure prayer help the Shechina, help the greater truth that is really in a big problem. And we're not cooperating. We're distracted. We're off on Nimrod. Our mind is crooked. We think any of this is okay. We think he doesn't care. He cares. We don't care. He put it in our hands. If we care, we will wake him up. If we don't care, then it was designed to just stay this way. And in fact, it was designed to continuously get worse, which is what staying this way means. Continuously get worse until we're going to care. We are going to care. Or are we going to care? We're going to care with every cell in our body. We're going to be ready to do anything. Just tell me anything. But what is it going to take to wake us up? What is it going to take for us to realize that we need to feel, we need to know, we need to understand right from wrong? That's the only way this is ever going to work. There's the unification of the bride and the groom. When he's already coming for the unification, he says, when we're going to the Yichud, you think he's still going to have the pill? You think the Russia is still going to be there for the occasion? No. He gets removed before. When it comes to the Yichud, when the Tzaddik finally woke up, then the bitter leaves then all the clothing gets removed. Then there's a unification with no barriers, with no boundaries. You spell the kapal love and then the demons have no power. There's no room for anything evil. There's no room for any bitter. There's an absolute embrace on all the dimensions, the spirit and the flesh. Everything united. May it happen soon. May it happen now indeed. <laughs>